All righty. Well, I think we're, we're good to go at this point. Um, so I will turn it over to you, Colleen. And um, uh, yeah, so we're ready to go. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Good evening, everyone. We're really excited to have everybody join us tonight um, to learn about scraping, squashing, and stopping lanternflies here in Concord Township. Um, we had the opportunity to meet Jessica Shahan a couple of weeks ago when um, council members spent the day working over at Newland Grist Mill, um, taking out some sticker bushes, which was lots of fun. Um, Jessica is a naturalist for Newland Grist Mill in Glen Mills, where she is responsible for the park's environmental education programs and habitat management programs. She received her MS in biology from the University of North Dakota, where she studied the landscape ecology of grassland songbirds. In addition to birds, she also has a strong interest in native plant species and working with kids in the outdoors, which is why I would imagine you do such a great job at Newland Grist Mill. We're really excited to have Jessica with us today. One of the things I'm really looking forward to hearing about are the low cost, ways that we can build traps here with everyday household items that we have in our homes tonight. So Jessica, um, I'm gonna turn it over to you and we look forward to hearing how we can scrape, squash and stop lanternflies. All right, so thanks for having me tonight. Um, this is definitely an important topic and one that um, a lot of people are gonna probably have questions about if not now, um, then very soon when these bugs start showing up again. Um, there we go. So a little bit of background for those who aren't familiar with Newland Grist Mill. We are a 160 acre park and historic site um, just off of Route 1 in Glen Mills. We have eight and a half miles of trails and a historic grist mill that was built in 1704 and a bunch of associated historic structures as well. And Part of our responsibility in maintaining this park is making sure that the plants and animals that live in it are healthy um, and available for the enjoyment of our community. And spotted lanternfly has the potential to have a huge impact on, on this, um, including all of the species that are listed um, or shown on this screen today. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about is basically some of the ways we have been working to get ready for spotted lanternfly. Um, this insect has been in the area since 2012, um, only really reached the park for us in 2019, but we've been getting ready for a while. So these are things that have worked for us or um, have worked well for other people in the region. So we'll go ahead and get started with the details. Um, basically a spotted lanternfly is a big bug that's in the wrong place. Um, so our spotted lanternfly is this guy here on the left. They are a plant hopper. Um, so you might be more familiar with a plant hopper that looks like this guy. You might have seen one in your garden or a meadow or a field. They're pretty small. This plant hopper um, from China, Bangladesh, Vietnam, is a little bit bigger. They can be up to an inch long. They've got that distinctive uh, spotted wing that gives them their name, and then, or at least the spotted part. And then the lantern fly comes from this little um, pair of structures here that are said to resemble a lantern. Um, as plant hoppers, these guys feed on plants by piercing the tissues with these long pokey mouth parts and sucking out the juices. Um, so this is what all plant hoppers do. It's not unique to the lantern fly. They secrete a little bit um, of a substance that's called honeydew. So it's the excess water and nutrients, sugars, that they're not using from those, those plants. Um, it's important to note that just because we might find it scary and it's doing harm in Pennsylvania does not mean that this bug is a bad bug you know, just inherently. The problem comes because we as humans have moved this bug from where it's supposed to be, um, where it has natural predators, where plant systems have evolved um, to deal with the honeydew, to a place where the predators have no idea what this is 
and there are no natural controls on its population. So we get these huge um, population booms and a lot more damage here than they cause um, back in China or, or Vietnam. So it's important to keep that in mind um, as we do talk about it because they're a really gorgeous insect. And you know, if it weren't for the bad bug reputation, I think they'd probably get a lot more love than they do. So this is a map of the United States that shows an estimate um, from 2018 of where lanternflies could end up eventually. Right now, they're primarily um, concentrated over here. They are moving north, south, and west, but they're not quite out here yet. So if they keep moving, they're going to have to hop this mountain barrier um, to spread out a little bit farther. In Pennsylvania, this is our current quarantine map. So counties under quarantine, it's identified there, they're spreading, and those areas need to be aware and, and conduct management controls. Um, as plant hoppers, you'd imagine they, they do hop. Um, they're not great flyers, but they are big enough that if they jump on a windy day, they can sort of catch the breeze and do some traveling that way. But the primary way these guys are moving around is people. And that's really what the quarantine is about. So egg masses are being moved, um, insects themselves are being moved, things like trucks, cars, um, shipments of, of goods, even people that have seen um, young lanternflies hitchhike on people to new locations. Um, so the primary way these guys are moving is, is through human activities. And because of that, we really need to be aware of how our actions can further that spread or halt it and, and keep those populations to a minimum. So a lot of people are asking, um, what's the big deal? Why, why are we so worried about these bugs? They don't bite, um, they're not going to attack you, so why do we care? There's a couple of reasons that all stem from this density-dependent feeding. Basically, um, these, these plant hoppers have preferences, and when they find a plant they like, all of the, the plant hoppers, all of the lanternflies in this area will join in the feeding. And so you can get these trees or these plants that are covered with hundreds to thousands of insects. One or two wouldn't be so bad, but when you get that many, you can start to have problems. So this is an example of a location where a lanternfly has been feeding. So they use their, their pokey mouth parts to break through the bark and get into those vascular tissues. They create a little hole where they're gonna suck out the fluids. Um, so you end up with a tree that is dehydrated and also nutrient deficient. So it's gonna be stressed. Then you've got a tree with its primary defense system, that bark, with a bunch of little holes in it. And that's gonna open it up to diseases, um, to other pests, to fungus, to mold. And so you've got a stressed tree that is now even more susceptible to, to problems in its environment. Then the feeding behavior, that honeydew that they secrete, makes the problem even worse. So you end up with a tree that's basically coated in sugar um, and all kinds of molds and fungus like to grow on the areas where that honeydew ends up. And so you get these really gross looking just accumulations of mold and fungus. Um, it's not always white, frequently it's black um, and you might hear it referred to as black mold around the tree, um, but none of it's gonna do that tree much good. And then those effects can be amplified up the food chains. So if this tree dies, um, you know, the bird that depended on its fruit, its berries, its nectar is out of a food source. And so you just get this whole escalating impact up through that system. So you get that many bugs, you get those big impacts, and it just, it amplifies from there. I did want to point out um, what damage looks like what the, that black mold looks like and what is natural, because um, I've heard this question before. So this tree down here on the right has been fed on by lanternflies. You can see that circular pattern of black 
Um, that's the black mold. There's a little bit on the lower trunk. You can think about primarily that mold is growing where gravity is dropping the honeydew. Um, this is a picture of a rail on a boardwalk. This is natural lichen. We've got some moss growing here. It's supposed to be here. So if you see this kind of stuff on a tree, you don't really have to worry. It just means your tree is growing in a, a more uh, damp setting that's favorable to, to uh, moss and lichens. But this is the pattern you need to look at. So that, that big, ugly circle. Now, if we're talking about lanternflies, we also have to talk about Tree of Heaven or Atlantis. Um, this is a tree that was brought to North America in the late 1700s. It's been here for a while. Um, this is not new at all. It's a kind of pretty tree. Um, and that's part of why it was initially brought here. Um, people planted it as a specimen in their gardens because they thought it looked nice. Um, it's also been used very widely as a shade tree for, for new construction because it grows really, really fast. And so you can get your big shade tree pretty quickly compared to some of our native species like oaks and maples. Um, the problem is that this, this tree is not a particularly well-behaved tree. Um, so it secretes compounds from its roots that actually alter the soil chemistry and discourages other plants from growing around it. So you get these huge colonies that are nothing but ailanthus trees. And this is not a tree that provides really many ecosystem services. Um, there aren't many bugs that feed on it. It doesn't produce berries for birds. Um, okay, it, it photosynthesizes and it gives us shade and that's about it. Um, it can cause major problems um, for roads, for sewers, for sidewalks, even building foundations because of how fast the roots grow. Um, so the key things to look at, they've got these, I think they're kind of fun, um, sort of twisty curly cue shaped seeds with that little seed pod there in the middle. They've got very, very long compound leaves with anywhere from 11 to 41 leaflets. Um, so these are big, big leaves compared to a lot of other species. Um, they have gray bark. When the trees are young, it starts off very smooth, but it gets rougher as, it, as the tree grows older. And then it's got these, these overall pinkish seeds that are sort of held above the leaf level. So like you've got the leaves growing and the seeds are gonna be above them. And it's important to recognize this tree because where Ailanthus grows is where, is where the lanternflies are gonna be. Um, they are attracted to this tree, both for feeding and egg laying. So controlling um, tree of heaven in the landscape is going to help us control lanternfly. Couple more helpful ID hints on each leaflet. You're gonna look for that little notch close to the end of the leaflet. That distinguishes Ailanthus from all of our other native trees that have these compound leaves. Um, that's an important detail to note. They also hold on to their seeds throughout the winter. So even if the tree doesn't have leaves, you can still look for those, those curly seeds on the ends of the branches. And so I wanted to show one other tree. This is a comparison. So this one is Ailanthus, that tree of heaven. Note the seeds held up above those long leaves. This is sumac. This is a tree that gets confused for Ailanthus very frequently. They're both kind of shrubby when they're young. They both are a little bit stinky when you cut into them. They also have long leaflets, but if you see the, um, the seed pods are very upright. The seeds themselves are very small and they're definitely not those, those little curly structures. Because this is a good plant to have around um, for your wildlife, especially if you like birds. So controlling lanternflies really comes down to knowing their life cycle and understanding what parts of the life cycle are gonna be around at that given time of year. So lanternflies have an incomplete life cycle. Basically they hatch out of eggs to their first 
stage or instar. We call each stage an instar. Um, and that instar is going to grow and shed and molt. And each stage is pretty much going to look like the one before it in terms of structure. It might add some different colors. Um, it'll get wings. But a baby lanternfly looks pretty similar to an adult. Um, this is in comparison to something like a butterfly, where the caterpillar looks nothing like an adult butterfly. That is complete metamorphosis. So two different life cycle state or uh, strategies, and this is the one that incomplete. They pretty much look the same all the way around the cycle. So from September to June, we've got eggs. So the female, like I said, they're going to look for um, Alanthus to initiate breeding, although they do not always lay their eggs on Alanthus. Um, they lay these little um, lines of seed-like eggs, and there's a bunch of lines. Each egg mass can hold between 30 and 50 eggs, and each female can lay multiple egg masses. So you can see how quickly that population can ramp up um, in an area just from having one or two lanternflies um, doing the egg laying. So she lays the eggs, she covers them with um, kind of a putty-like substance. It starts out very light and it, it gets darker over time. So new egg masses are um, gray, they're kind of shiny. They, they tend to stand out pretty obviously against the background. It's when they get older that they're a little bit harder, um, harder to spot. So they, they start to darken, they dry out, that cover, that putty starts to crack. And then when they're really old, which is pretty much what we'd be seeing around now, um, you just see the individual eggs because that putty cover has fallen off. So this is a little game um, to help you sharpen your egg mass spotting skills. Um, so these are all pretty obvious egg masses. They're, they're relatively young or, or new. Um, we've got some very light ones that were recently laid. There's some little bit darker ones. This is on a post in a vineyard um, because they do um, very much like grapes. And if you look closely, you can actually see a couple on a grapevine in the back. So those are relatively easy to spot. They're not that hard. It's not always that easy, unfortunately. <laughs> um, here we get a little bit harder. This is an egg mass that's a little bit older, uh, laid on an ironwood stem. So you can see that the cover is still there, but it's starting to crack. It's not as shiny, but it does, it does still stand out if you're paying attention. And we get a little bit harder. <laughs> This was on a tree. Um, this is an Alanthus tree, but it's higher up. So this is well above eye level. It's an older egg mass. It's blending in with that background. Um, you gotta pay a bit more attention for the ones in spots like this. And finally, we get to the more complicated ones. These are the really old egg masses. So the cover, that putty cover has completely fallen off. We're just seeing the individual tracks of eggs. And so you can see there's an egg mass there. There's one there. There's a bunch in there. Down there. 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 Lots of them all over this tree. And this is an Alanthus tree. So you can see um, sort of the quantity that we can be talking about in a small location. From May to June, we're getting those egg masses hatching. So we're not quite here yet, but as soon as it warms up just a little bit more, this is the life stage we will be seeing. These guys are, are tiny. Um, you can see the scale, there's somebody's thumb there in the picture for, for a sense of scale. Um, tiny little guys, overall black body with these really distinctive uh, white spots. Even on the legs, they've got those nice white spots. Rounded body. Um, They've still got those long piercing mouth parts, but they're small, so they can't really get through the bark of a tree. They're gonna be feeding on softer plants. Um, so you're not quite your big trees, but maybe your small saplings, maybe some flowers, until they've fed enough 
that they're ready to, to molt into their next instar. From here, June through July, we've got our second and third instars. These guys are basically just bigger versions of those first instars. So we get a little bit bigger each time, but we keep that basic black and white um, spotted body pattern. July to September, things start getting a little more interesting. This is where we get our fourth instars starting to show up. These guys are the, the fancy instars. They've added uh, red to their, their color scheme. They've still got the black base. They've still got the white spots, but they've got red patches too. And they're getting bigger. These guys are about three quarters of an inch. This is also the time of year that you can have multiple life stages present on a plant at the same time. So this is why you've got to know that whole life cycle to understand what you're looking at. So we've got the little tiny um, black and white guys, that's the third in stars. We've got our red fourth in stars, and then our adults, which are the fifth in stars, all present on this one plant. July to December, this is our adults. This is the, the image I think most people think of when they think of a lanternfly, because it's what we see most in, in the news. Um, this is what they look like when they're at rest. It's that nice folded wings. Those spots are really obvious, the little red lanterns. But if they're flying, they can look a little different. So they've got these nice bright red patches on their underwings. They have a really flashy um, yellow abdomen as well. And so they do, they do look different when they're moving around than if they're, if they're resting with their wings folded. And it's important to know, again, both of those, um, those visual cues for when you're, you're hunting for them. So that's all about the life cycle. It's a lot of detail. Um, the question becomes, okay, so they get bigger, they have different instars, what, what do we do? How do we make a difference? Um, in curbing this population spread. There are different things you can do at different times of year, just like those different life, st uh, life stages are present. There is one thing you can do almost all year round, and that is making sure that your home is not a place that lanternflies would like to be. And the primary way to do that is you just make sure you don't have any ailanthus trees. Um, the best, the, the most effective way to do that is by treating with herbicide. And you can do that anytime that green leaves are present. So you want the tree to be awake and moving, um, moving fluids up and down through its vascular system or this won't work. Um, I know this picture was taken when there was snow on the ground, but it was treated earlier in the fall. So if it's a small tree, you can just cut down the trunks and treat the cut surface with your herbicide. Um, that's pretty basic for when your tree is small and easy to take down, and it, it works quite well. If your tree is larger, maybe it's in a place that you can't cut it down easily, but you still want it dead, um, you can use a method that's called hack and squirt. Basically, you use a, a hatchet, um, cut some notches in the tree through the bark to the vascular system, and you're going to just, you know, squirt the herbicide into those cuts rather than cutting down the whole tree like we did here. In both cases, the tree's vascular system will move that herbicide through all the tissues and kill the tree. So that's something, like I said, you can do as long as the, that there are leaves present. And that's gonna mean that you don't have that nice buffet to bring the lanternflies in in the first place. Okay, in March and April, our goals should really be preventing new individuals from hatching out of those eggs, keeping them from emerging, because they're a lot easier to take care of when they're in an egg and not hopping around, and killing off newly emerged instars. So an easy way to get rid of those egg masses is just to scrape the eggs. Um, Penn State Extension has this recommendation for just a real cute, simple, um, little egg scraping kit. Basically all you need is a baggie or, or a jar, jars work too, some alcohol-based hand sanitizer and something to scrape eggs with. And they recommend one of their little scraper cards. You put the hand sanitizer in the bag, scrape the egg mass directly into the alcohol 
and the, the eggs will die from contact with the alcohol. Super easy. Um, and you don't have to chase bugs around. I have heard a few people worry um, that like touching the egg mass might cause little baby lanternflies to come out and get you. That won't happen. Just scrape the eggs, don't worry about that. Um, now we saw how difficult some of those egg masses are to see. So chances are we're never gonna be able to get all of the egg masses. And the easiest way to sort of provide a backup is to create trap trees. So this is a tree that is attractive to lanternflies, but is treated with a pesticide um, so that when they feed on the tree, they ingest the pesticide and then they die before they can grow and eventually lay their own eggs. This is a picture of um, different tree species, different pests. This is an ash tree being treated for emerald ash borer, but the system is the same. Basically, you're giving the tree a, an IV like you, you would administer a medication. And that's gonna make the tree toxic to that lanternfly. And remember I said not many other insects feed on a lanthus. So this is a really good way to target our, our main pest species without accidentally killing off a lot of the wildlife that we do want to have in our backyards. From May to August, it's all about making sure those bugs don't move around. Um, I mentioned they can lay their eggs in a lot of different places. This was just a quick Google search that showed those weird locations. Um, we've got a whole bunch of egg masses on an old tire. There's a bunch of new egg masses on somebody's basketball that they left outside. And here's one, a very fresh one, on somebody's gardening hat. Um, so the trick is, in those months, May to August, when you're moving things around, just pay attention. Double check before you bring something into your home, into your yard. Make sure it's not covered in lanternfly egg masses. Make sure they're not you know, hidden somewhere. They do like to uh, lay eggs in those kind of sheltered areas. So just check thoroughly. And that includes not just objects, but vehicles too. They really like um, wheel wells, cars, undercarriages, um, construction materials, even tools that you've left outside. Um, so just, you know, as you're moving things around, pay attention to what you're moving. Make sure you're confirming that it doesn't have egg masses or those early instars on it as you're moving, um, especially if you're moving materials from inside the quarantine zone to outside the quarantine zone. The other option is again, there are are egg masses that are gonna be easy to miss, we can use traps. And this is where those easy at-home designs come in. Now, many people have probably seen these sticky bands advertised very, very, very heavily. As a biologist, as a person who works with a lot of wildlife rehabilitators, please do not use these. Um, at least not, not this way, like this picture shows. It's kind of grainy, but basically the instars, the little babies, they walk up the tree trunk, they walk onto the sticky surface and they get stuck. And that works great for the first few, but as more walk up, they're able to walk over the stuck dead uh, lanternflies that were already there. They get a little bit farther and a little bit farther and a little bit farther until basically they have a bridge of dead lantern flies all the way over your sticky tape. Um, it's expensive to change these out as often as they need. It's time consuming. There are better ways. And then there's also a, a very bad downside to these sticky traps. And that is because these traps do not only catch lantern flies. Birds, bats, even butterflies, have all been caught on these sticky traps and many of them do not survive. Um, this especially targets um, wildlife that are up and down tree trunks a lot. So think things like woodpeckers and nuthatches, um, you know, foraging on those tree trunks. Things like bats that are looking for um, roosting spots. You might see butterflies light, trying to find spaces to lay eggs. Um, even squirrels 
have been known to get caught in these traps. So really just, just don't use these um, in this fashion. There's, there's too much um, bycatch, too much loss of species that we're not really aiming for. If you do feel like sticky traps are your only option, the best thing to do is cover them with wire um, at least a couple inches away from the trunk. And that way you've got a barrier so the bugs can still get in, they can still get caught, but the bigger animals aren't, aren't gonna be able to run all the way up and get stuck all the way you know, down their belly or their wings. But again, there are better options for traps. And this is where these cheap, easy traps come in. This is a circle trap. Um, they are super easy to build. Um, basically, you, you're creating a funnel that is using the lanternfly's own movement patterns. So those behaviors of starting at the bottom of the tree and moving up to the top. And it funnels them, so they walk up the trunk and they bump up into this wall. And then they're gonna follow that wall all the way up here through a little funnel and into your collecting device. It could be a bag, it could be a jar, whatever you have around. From here, you can easily swap them out. You can empty it every day, you can empty it every other day, whatever, whatever your yard needs. And then um, there's really no risk for catching the birds, the bats, the other wildlife that those sticky traps are targeting. Um, like I said, they're cheap, very easy to make. There are tons of um, patterns out there. Just do a quick um, Google search for lanternfly circle trap. Uh, Penn State Extension, I, I popped this uh, website up here because they have what I think are quite nice, um, easy to follow directions. So you can check that out as well. So August to December, you can still use those circle traps, um, but a lot of times they get clogged because these guys, they're, we're talking adult insects that are up to an inch long at this point. Our goals, we wanna kill them. We wanna kill the adults. Um, they, they move around a lot, but you can still have fun squishing them, just break out the, the fly swatter. Um, it's not that hard. You can get kids really into it. They really like this activity. Um, you can, another option, and I like this one. Um, you don't have to be quite as precise as the fly swatter. You take a jar, wide mouth jar, fill it with a little bit of alcohol. Um, lantern flies tend to jump towards the thing that they are reacting to. So if you hold up the jar, they jump towards the jar and end up popping right into the alcohol. So you don't even really have to squish. You, you let them do all the work for you. Um, and then again, remember to make sure those egg masses are not moving around. Um, check all the surfaces, check all the things before, before you do any moving. Because um, the more egg masses we can identify and scrape now, the less we will have to worry about hatching in the spring. And then it gets cold and the adults die off because they do not like the cold temperatures, but those egg masses will survive. Um, so far, we've not seen any indication that our, our temperatures that we typically have in Pennsylvania in the winter really, really do much to, to kill them off through freezing. So this is a lot of information. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions, but I do wanna end with the note that there's something we can all do. There, it's, it's a big problem, but it's not an overwhelming one. Um, we have natural predators out there that are learning that lanternflies taste pretty darn good, um, such as this baby bluebird. He's having a nice lanternfly snack. Um, and you don't have to treat a whole forest or a whole park. The actions that you take in your own, in your own yard, in your own neighborhood will make a difference. And, and we all have a part to play. So with that, if anybody has any questions. Jessica, thank you so much. Um, what we wanna do right now is open it up for questions. So if you have a question and you can type it into the chat box, Amanda is going to be checking those questions and we will have Jessica answer them. Yep. Jessica, that was a ton of information. <laughs> it is, there's a lot there. 
Okay. okay. I, if you guys are ready, I have a first question that's starting to come up. Um, uh, our neighborhood is surrounded by trees of paradise. Any advice? That's so if they're on neighborhood property, it's worth talking to your neighbors, um, sharing the control information, take down as many as you can, um, designate a few trap trees, go from there. Um, beyond that, it's worth talking to um, state agencies. I know PennDOT has worked on some um, sort of roadside ailanthus eradication projects because you get a lot of it in those roadside wastelands. Um, there are resources out there. Sometimes it's even just letting the right people know that there's a, this is a big problem area. Can you take a look at it? Um, Department of Agriculture is um, really who's handling this sort of stuff. So you can direct those like, hey, we have a land this and it's on public land questions in, in that direction. That's great. I have a comment. Uh, I have found the fly swatter method, a hit with the grandkids and a unique opportunity to talk about trees in the yard. So that was great. Yep. Um, we have another question. Is it true that Dawn Soap Reservoir will kill them? So the Dawn dish soap, basically, um, so it's a surfactant that disrupts the surface tension of the water that it's in. So you're basically making it harder for the lanternflies to climb out of the reservoir. So they're drowning and the Dawn dish soap is making it easier for them to drown, basically. Okay, I have another question. Is there a certain side of a tree the egg masses are typically found on, north, south, east, west? Whatever's more sheltered. From, from the wind. So like if you have a tree that's growing sort of at a tilted angle, they're probably gonna be on the downhill side. It's not so much cardinal directions as shelter from the elements, from the wind, from the rain. Um, that's, that's really where you need to look. Okay, um, another question. Will PennDOT remove Alanthus from the right of ways along roads? I know they have done some I do not know where that project stands currently. Some work has been done. Um, okay. It may be a question of funding or, or effort, <laughs> um, but that, that's a good question to ask them. We would hope that there are programs out there that, that landowners um, can tap into for that sort of thing as well. Sure, and at the township, Colleen, um, I'm not sure, but um, we might, be able to ask that question of PennDOT if they have any programs where they are removing the tree of heaven along right of ways. Yeah, I think that's a great idea for us to follow up on and, you know, go, Amanda, I know that there's some work that the township is doing. Maybe we can identify if there's any of those trees on any of our parks or properties that we want to pay particular attention to. Um, we do have our township staff that are going to be going out to different parks and sections, installing signage for awareness of the lantern fly and what to do at different times of the year. So look for that in different parking lots and parks throughout the township. And we are also um, going to be placing some traps in, in some areas throughout the township. So you'll be seeing the township really starting to take a very proactive approach to handling um, you know, the, the scrape, squash, and stop of the lantern flies over the next um, several weeks. Great. I have another great question. What can I do to keep them off my vegetable garden plants, cucumbers, tomatoes, etc., without using pesticides? Netting. You want um, a, a real small netting, very fine. Um, a lot, I, I was just looking at this in the context of protecting some of our trees from, from the cicadas that will be out shortly, um, but the, the principle still holds for lantern flies. Um, very fine mesh that you cover over the whole plant and then secure the base so that the, um, the instars can't get to the leaves to feed. Um, without pesticides, you really, you're looking at barriers to their movement is the main thing you can do. 
Great. Uh, here's another good one. And I just got a puppy not long ago. So I'm curious on this one. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can ask this, answer this, Jessica, because you're not a veterinarian, but you might know. <laughs> My dog eats the dead lantern flies. Can this harm him? So I know a little bit about this, but not all the details because <laughs> I'm not sure veterinarians know either right now um, because we just haven't been in close proximity with this insect for that long. Um, it seems like some dogs get upset stomach problems when they, when they eat lanternflies, but it's not consistent. Um, so I would say that if your dog hasn't already shown symptoms of an upset stomach, that it probably falls in that category of not very bothered. Um, it sounds like the effects are pretty immediate, you know, like, like if you ate bad food and you got an upset stomach, not so much long-term impacts. Great. Um, another question, uh, since you said hand sanitizer kills them, would a 70% alcohol spray that you can get over the counter at CVS or other store, stores also kill the eggs if you spray it on them? Not, not really, because um, you've got to get through the, um, that putty covering and you have to get through the, the egg covering. So that little hard surface of the egg. And I'm not sure that the alcohol is gonna do that. That's why you squish the eggs open and you expose the contents to that alcohol that will definitely kill them. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, and thank you everyone so much for the questions. We have a lot of questions, this is great. Um, thank you, Jessica. This is more of a comment. This was a lot of good info us, for us to be aware of uh, in terms of the stages and what the egg masses look like. Um, here's another question. Uh, we have one large Alanthus in the woods behind us, also smaller ones along the state road. Is it worth keeping the one large one as a lure to keep the bugs off of our other trees? It depends on how much Atlantis is, is around you. Um, if there are only a few saplings that you could cut down and treat and take care of real quick, then by all means, keep that trap tree. If there are just Atlantis trees everywhere in really high density, it's not gonna do much. You might as well just take it out and remove that, that attractant because um, they're, they're already gonna be there. All right, I have another question that came in. We had masses of them on the black cover of our grill last year. Why are they attracted to this and can anything be done? Maybe we need to put the grill in the garage. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I don't know so much about colors that they're attracted to. I haven't seen a lot about that, but those smooth or semi-smooth semi surfaces, um, maybe even warm surfaces, like a nice black cover that warms up in the sunlight. Um, yeah, they really seem to draw them. So probably best just to not leave stuff outside to get, get covered. <laughs> okay, uh, I have another question in the chat and then we have some questions in the Q&A portion over here too. Um, would the over-the-counter rubbing alcohol kill them if we set out jar with rubbing alcohol in them? I get them on my front porch when they are in that first stage of instar. You have to get the lantern flies into the alcohol. They don't really have any reason to go there um, if it's just sitting in a jar. And so that's kind of what, what those traps do is funneling them to where they have no choice but to interact with the alcohol that will kill them. Same with um, the adult lantern flies. Like I said, I like to use that jar method for the adults. Um, they're not going to hop in on their own, but if you freak them out enough that they feel startled and they jump, then you've got that contact that you need. Okay, I have um, another question. What other birds will eat these bugs? Um, so I've seen wrens, like Carolina wrens and house wrens, really, really going to town on them. Um, there's some evidence, although I have not seen this for myself of tree swallows snagging them um, when they're doing that like coasting on the breeze thing. Um, 
Let's see. Those are the main ones, wrens, bluebirds, um, the swallows. The other thing is uh, praying mantids. I've seen a bunch of lanternfly wings left under a plant that has praying mantids in it. That's so another that's, question. That's another. <laughs> that's another question coming up are praying mantis predators and it seems like they are yes the trick with that um is make sure you are encouraging your carolina mantids um so there are a couple different species of praying mantids in our region there's our carolina which is the native one there's the really big large chinese mantids and then there's the european narrow-winged mantid the two non-native ones can actually also eat birds, like hummingbirds. Um, so it's that balancing act. You know, encourage the ones that are supposed to be here. Don't necessarily go out and buy, because you can still buy egg masses of Chinese mantids for garden control. Try not to do that. Encourage the ones that are already there. Um, here's a question. It has been recommended to me to use Dino to furin, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, which is a systemic insecticide that seemed to work well. We had infestations on the young branches of walnut and hickory trees. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that one. so that's um, one of the chemical options that you can use for this kind of injection. So basically you put it in a canister, you hook the tree up with these little IVs into ports, and you pressurize the canister and the pressure forces that chemical through the tubes into the tree. So that's the systemic part. So you're not spraying, you're not surface treating the tree, you're getting it directly into the tree's systems, its tissues. And that is one of the recommended um, chemicals that can be used. Here's another chemical question too. Will neem oil work on the vegetable garden? I have not seen a lot one way or the other. Okay. I mean, you can always try it and report back and see if it is effective. I mm -hmm. mean, they haven't been here that long. And so we are still trying um, to see what works. So it, it's great. always an option. I mean, a, a negative result at least tells us one way or the other. So Got it. Um, another... Uh, I think you already answered this though, but it was, can the egg mass be sprayed with alcohol to kill the eggs instead of scraping? But it appears that the scraping is the better method. Is that yep, right, Justin? Scraping is 100% effective. Spraying is not guaranteed. Got it. Um, the other person following up who asked the question about the dino to furin says to apply it, the application process was to spray around the tree on the ground under the fall line and allow the tree to take it up in the root system? Yeah, that, that works. Um, generally, I, I tend to, to emphasize more targeted approaches. So when you're spraying, broadcast spraying pesticides directly on the ground, you're impacting everything that touches that ground. That's going to be um, other insects, you know, your butterflies, your Chinese or your uh, Carolina mantids that you want to keep around. That's going to be your birds, your small mammals, your snails, uh, your earthworms, your ladybugs. Um, so yes, it will get into the tree, but the injection is just so much more targeted and faster because it's already directly in there as opposed to waiting for the pesticide to seep into the ground and then for the roots to take it up. Um, that's, that's why I really like the, the direct injection method better. Um, here's another question. Do the SLFs typically prefer shade over sunny areas? Um, I think when just my own personal observations in the park, those smaller in stars, the first and second in stars, um, yeah, you do, you see them a lot on like the underside of leaves, a little bit shadier areas, but as they get bigger, it seems like that effect wears off and then they're just wherever they would like to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's one, and I'm thinking if this were the eighties, if it's true, the bug wouldn't survive. Does hairspray disable the lanternflies? <laughs> 
Because I don't think these babies would have made it out of that error. I feel like you'd have to go through a lot of hairspray to make a difference. <laughs> and like that would get very expensive very quickly. Okay, uh, another question. These are all great. Um, Penn State was collecting information when homeowners saw SLFs on their property. Is Penn State still monitoring this information which helps their quarantine efforts? I believe so. Um, but I, I think they're more focused on the edges of the quarantine zone. Like we've got it, we've got large numbers. They already know that. They're trying to track what direction it's spreading um, and where, where they need to focus more of their education and their, their targeted early prevention efforts. Um, but I believe that reporting website is still available. Yeah, I, be I believe it is too, Jessica. Um, here's another question. What surface applied insecticide works well and how and when to apply? Um, I, I'm honestly not sure specifically on that one because we in the park don't, don't use surface applied insecticides. Um, very often. <laughs> um, herbicides, like if we wanted to stump treat or, or do that hack and squirt method, um, I tend to use Garlon, uh, which is a water watershed wetland safe um, herbicide. So it's, it's a little bit safer to use near creeks, streams, wetlands, places like that. How do you spell that, Jessica? Garlo, how do you uh, say it? G-A-R-L-O-N. Perfect. Um, okay, and then is there an urgency where we can send pictures of masses if we are unsure if it's a mass or just some sort of tree growth? Is there an agency? I'm sorry, is there an agency? Oh. Um, the USDA is the place to go for that. Okay. And then a few more questions back to the chemical system. Uh, how would a layman do the direct injection of a systemic chemical? Um, you, you need to hire somebody. Um, they do, they have certification um, and they know, cause there's a, um, a formula you need to follow to figure out how many ports for each tree that's based on size and then the um, concentration of the chemical they're using. Um, you know, a, a lot of these uh, pest treatment companies are, are uh, trained for this now. They've got all kinds of information. It, I, I lean towards let's let the, the trained people do that application. Okay. okay, another question. Since you have shown egg masses on all kinds of trees and items, what is the significance of the tree you are talking about? It's a magnet, <laughs> basically. So the Elanthus is gonna bring all those lantern flies into the area. From there, they're gonna look for whatever surfaces look good to them for egg laying. So if you remove that attractant, they don't have a reason to move into the area. So, it, you know, it's, it's about making that area less attractive to stop the spread. Um, is there any news about a pesticide that attracts and then kills them? Not that I've heard so far. <laughs> um, there is research into um, various mites and diseases and things like that that might be able to be released um, that can be a natural curve on the population. You know, getting, getting those population controls in place that are already present in their, their native habitats, their native ranges that are just, that are missing here. Um, but those are very, very early. Um, you know, in terms of scientific studies, lanternflies really haven't been with us long enough to, to have all the answers to that kind of thing yet. 
we're still in that learning phase. Um, I think we talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, does dishwasher liquid and water work if you spray it on the spotted lantern fly? No, it, it really um, just makes it easier for them to drown in a bucket of water if the dish soap is there, as opposed to being highly toxic um, to the bug directly. Okay, and it looks like we have one more question left. Um, and I think it's a good one to end on, to be quite frank, but will these lantern flies move on after a few years? Probably not. Um, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> we, we will probably always have some, some level of population of these bugs. The goal is to get that population level down to a point where it's not causing that damage, but they'll probably always be here. Um, we just need to find that, that population point. Got it. And one more just came in. So I guess we'll take it uh, <laughs> if the timing still works. Um, when, you when you mentioned scraping the bugs, do you scrape them into a jar and then get rid of the whole jar? Get rid of the jar? Yeah. So I like to use the baggies more than the jar for scraping. Um, so, you know, you fill up the, the baggie, it's full of alcohol dead eggs, and then you can just toss it. Or you could use the jar as much as you want, fill it up, empty it, and, and reuse. Um, just, you know, whatever's comfortable for you. Um, but yeah, once they're dead, they can go in the trash. <laughs> so the next yeah. comment was maybe the cicadas will <laughs> take away the lantern flies. And it, and it did make me think that, you know, are there things that we should be doing about the cicadas? Um, yeah, so, good for us. <laughs> so we, uh, we've actually been working on this just this week in the park, getting ready. Um, big trees, they're fine. Um, basically, the problem comes when the cicadas oviposit, so they lay their eggs inside skinny tree branches. And then the larvae hatch out, they destroy the tissues, they can girdle that, that little limb. So on a big tree that has a lot of big branches, it's not a problem. The tree might lose a few skinny branches, but overall it's fine. The problem comes when you have small trees, newly planted trees um, that are all made of little skinny branches. So that's, that's the trees that you really need to protect. Um, so we are, we're using the mesh. Um, we're covering our, our new and small plantings with, with mesh. Um, and for those guys, it needs to be a quarter of an inch square or smaller to keep them out. Well, we got a lot to worry about this summer. <laughs> it's kind of cool though, um, with the cicadas, with brood 10, if you think about um, just the biology of how that develops, you know, it's, they're not coming out all at once and yelling to annoy us. You know, they're, it's a predator avoidance strategy. If you all emerge at once, only so many will be eaten at a time. So it's, it's a predator deterrent. It, it's a pretty cool one, I think, <laughs> even if it is noisy. We might have to do a follow-up session on that. <laughs> well, Jessica, thank you so much. We keep getting comments um, through the chat saying, thank you. This was mm -hmm. great information, um, very valuable, easy to use, um, you know, you took information and brought it down to a level where we could all go out into our yards tomorrow and do mm -hmm. something to help keep that population down. Um, Amanda, we will be posting this live stream recording on the, the township website. And so residents that weren't able to join us tonight will be able to um, watch this and ask some of the questions and, and see some of the practical techniques and tips that you gave everybody. So um, Jessica, thank you so much. We are so lucky in Concord Township to have you and Newland Gristmill um, as part of you know, the, the great open space and green greenery that we have. And you guys do a fantastic job connecting with our community, um, kids in summer camps and activities throughout the year. You guys just do a great job. We, we are so honored to have you here in Concord Township. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I, I think um, that ends it, our session for tonight. Um...
thank you all. And we'll look to um, maybe bring Jessica back for an encore performance on <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Okay. Take care. Thank you, Jessica. Good night. Yep. Thanks. Good